Well, Cliff, it's great having you back here with HFS to uh, talk a bit about the industry. Um, but obviously, in the last, uh, well, since November 30th in particular, we've uh, had a lot to get excited about with the advent of ChatGPT. It's raced to 100 million users. Now we've had the launch of GPT-4, which on the surface seems to be a significant upgrade in terms of capability. Um, but let's start with whether you're enthusiastic or scared about where AI is heading at this moment and why. Well, I'm very enthusiastic. Um, what, what we're experiencing now has been developing probably for five, six, seven years. Um, you know, we're, we've seen capabilities like this in very tightly controlled, confined um, environments where technology companies were able to train models on very specific fit for purpose use cases and they performed quite well. But to really broaden that out, like like you would uh, with the capabilities you would see in a large language model, that just wasn't feasible or practical until until more recently. And you know the the capabilities just keep uh, accelerating. I mean, we there's this network effect now, which is bringing more data in and more investment, more excitement, and it's uh, it's just driving very rapid improvement. So now I'm very excited. I, I guess the the main um, concern I would have is just the speed of change and the ability to adapt to the the changes that are happening and organizations that are very traditional and they've got a you know very entrenched operating model those organizations that are most impacted by this will be um, really challenged to make the changes um, necessary to compete with companies that are evolving and developing that are underpinned by artificial intelligence in, in a way that's more native to their business model and their operating model. Right. So it's a little bit of both. You know, there's there's you you can't help but be excited when you see this type of technology actually work um, in, in a way that's economical and practical. Um, but you know, you you really see the writing on the wall for legacy businesses that really have to change and have to adapt in a big way probably like in a way we haven't seen before um, in our right. lifetime. We've read about it, uh, but, uh, you know, back during the Industrial Revolution, but we, we've we never seen this type of this type of magnitude um, of, of change happening at a speed that, uh, that that this is happening. I mean, nobody even heard this term, what, six months ago, eight months ago? Nobody, nobody yeah. knew what GPT was. And now it's just it's in the vocabulary of your kids. Your kids are doing homework with it. You're doing art assignments. You're producing yeah. video. And this is just uh, this just happened overnight. So yeah. there's a lot to there's a lot to digest and process if you're a business leader and running a run, running a company. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity if you're an entrepreneur or if you're in a business or a company that's entrepreneurial and you see the opportunity. Yeah. Um, so do you think we'll reach a ceiling um, with capability in the next couple of years with AI, with especially with Gen AI? Or do you think this is an ongoing journey towards this AGI, this artificial general intelligence? And um, I know you were a big follower of Kurzweil and uh, his 2029 prediction that uh, AI will pass the Turing test in 2029, et cetera. Um, how real is this in terms of hitting a ceiling and moving beyond that ceiling? And, and you know, um, has this changed your outlook in terms of um, whether we will reach AGI? No, I. You re recall when we had Kurzweil at our event in 2016, and I interviewed him after his presentation, yeah. and he said, you know, in the next six or seven years. We're going to be having interesting conversations with AI, which seemed crazy in 2016. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he said in the early 2020s, we'll have interesting conversations. By the mid 2020s, those interesting conversations will become meaningful. And by the late 2020s, 
we will be uh, you, we, we will form relationships with technology, technology you, you, relationships that are approaching more like a human relationship with the technology. And he said that would be in the late 2020. So he's dead on in terms of interesting. You can't argue that, that the conversations yeah. we're having now are not interesting. They are interesting. And, um, you know, they are approaching meaningful conversations. When you really learn how to prompt and you learn how to get the most out of some of the most advanced large language models, those can approach meaningful conversations and dialogues. If you keep these threads going and, and uh, keep the conversation alive, the, the, the capabilities, the memory capabilities it has to reference and build on a very long thread in conversation, those can, those can become quite meaningful. And and helpful in more ways than just business productivity. They can it can help you think. It can help spur new ideas. So I think we're on that path. I do think that the I do think that there are some geopolitical realities that may slow things down a little bit. It has nothing to do with technology stalling. It has really more to do with the ability to spin up new mine, mining operations and uh, and uh, cr create new supply chains and new chip uh, manufacturing facilities uh, at the same kind of speed that we're used to. But um, assuming those things happen, um, the progress will continue. Um, there's, right. I don't see any limitation on, on that. I think the, the supply chain will be a challenge. Um, rare earth materials required you're you're competing the same rare earths that are needed for green energy are the same materials that are needed for advanced chips and there are geopolitical tensions right now which are impeding uh, the, the importation of the of those materials at the scale that we will need for uh, the type of computation that's going to be required so i you know those are some of the hurdles uh, to 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 get past over the next decade. Yeah, I mean, but why is Gen, you know, how and why do you see Gen AI different from other technological disruptions? You know, we we're talking about um, automation and machine learning in particular a decade ago, and you know, a lot of them have now been dubbed as foundational tech, right? Um, which might be a way of saying they're legacy tech. But why is Gen AI different from other technological disruptions in your view? Well, this is a, so, so a couple of things. One, this is a tool. This is a productivity tool in, in a narrow sense. Um, and it has broad access. Uh, you, you know, you, you have many people, almost anybody can access this. Anybody with a smartphone can access this very powerful technology. That's different. You, they're not it's not expensive um, not huge license fees um, and it's a very powerful technology um, but at its most basic level it 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 simply improves productivity the transformative nature of this requires a lot more it requires a technology architecture that allows a, a core systems and data to interchange with these you know more yeah, exchange data with these more advanced uh, neural networks and processing technologies, um, and that's that's a little more of a challenge. And that's those are some of the barriers that have to be overcome at the enterprise level. But you know, I I equate this more like the you know, when Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, the light electricity had been around for 50 years, 100 years. We everybody knew about electricity. They couldn't really find that use case that it, you know, really made it economical to produce electricity until the light bulb came. And then once the light bulb came along, everybody could put a light bulb in their house. Factories could put light bulbs in their factories, create 24 hour productivity. But the light bulb was a tool, but because it had such broad applicability, much like GPT 
has today. It spurred more investment in the electrical infrastructure, which spurred more innovation beyond the light bulb. You had the washing machine and the refrigerator and the air conditioner, and then ultimately electronics and computers all on the back of that. And it's not because electricity was new. Electricity was around, but it was because that one invention that made it accessible for everybody on the planet, everybody had a use for it. So I think that's more of a metaphor to, towards this. It's not a perfect metaphor, but it, you know, it's 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 very relevant to what we're experiencing today with, um, you know, this this tool that allows a kid to do his homework faster. It allows uh, a person to get started on a book uh, faster. It doesn't necessarily replace the human. But it makes that human more productive. And now more investment is uh, flowing in to create more innovation. So what's after GPT-4? What's after the diffuser model? What's What comes next? Well, there's a lot of potential technologies that come next, but something is coming. And the innovation dollars that are flowing into these technologies are going to accelerate that. And it'll come a little faster than we probably predicted two or three years ago, because there's so much attention focused on innovating around artificial intelligence. So, you know, that's, I I think if you you look back a hundred years and you kind of see how that happened, this is just gonna happen a lot faster. You know, from the time the light bulb was invented in what, 1879, it was, 50 years before really everything was electrified and, you know, more than half the population had electric lighting. Uh, This is going to happen a lot faster because we already have the grid, the electric grid. It's called the cloud. We've got so many things in place that are going to accelerate this. Um, It's really a human issue around how how do humans change and adapt to this new way of working and this new relationship with technology because technology takes on more of that type of feel. It's more of like a partner than um, a calculator that you might have in your in your pocket. Yeah, that's a great analogy around the speed, like electricity, it's a new, it's an emerging capability. Um, so when you think about reskilling, I mean, you're obviously having a lot of conversations with all sorts of enterprises, I'm sure, and partners and ecosystem players, hyperscalers, that sort of thing. How fast does this reskilling need to happen? Um, and, um, you know, how, and what is the best way for enterprise leaders to, to drive that reskilling? Well, that's going to be the competitive advantage, or that's going to be, if, if you think of how, how do you compete? Talent and skill sets in this area is one of the pillars that you have to pursue, and you have to pursue it aggressively. Um, you know, the, the the companies that win are going to be the companies that are able to partner their talent and their skill sets most effectively and most quickly with this type of technology. So there's infrastructure elements that are important. There's ecosystem elements that are also important. But the reskilling of the workforce to get the work to get this in the hands of the people, get them comfortable with it, get the policies in place that allow uh, the employees to work with this technology in a way that doesn't put the business at risk. Um, the companies that are able to do that faster are going are going to have an advantage. Um, you know, starting from the basics, understanding how to prompt, understanding how to work with the technology, understanding the rules and the policies so that you don't violate contracts that you may have in your in your business or put your business at risk. Uh, you don't want to leak IP. Uh, uh, you want to contain your proprietary data and intellectual property. Uh, so all of those things are important you have to do this all at the same time. And so the companies that are spinning up the capabilities to transform, transform safely, 
responsibly but quickly are going to be the ones that have more of an advantage. Uh, there's going to be industries too that are just more uh, suited for this type of technology than others. And, um, you know, those industries and those sectors, you know, media, uh, telecommunications, uh, technology, healthcare, consumer, you know, these are these are industries that are likely moving the fast, you know, the fastest. Uh, but um, I can't really think of an industry that won't be touched by this. It just may be uneven. It may be, you know, more in some industries and less than others. It may happen more quickly. There may be more startups that see opportunity to disrupt. You know, there may be a Netflix out there looking for the Blockbuster or an iTunes looking for the Kodak. And, um, you know, so you may just see like totally different uh, business models going after traditional industries. Yeah. It's been a huge, uh, we, we've rolled out our large language model with HFS. We've just put out all our research taking back to 2021. And it's incredible how suddenly we've got a whole bunch of new people accessing our research that weren't doing it. Like guys at your level were just going to go, hey, I'm just going to go in and run a search on what the hell HFS has been saying about me and my competitors or something. And you'll get very quick information beautifully summarized in Right, you know, style you like, and um, you know, in the past, in, in the probably... style, in the style and voice of Phil First, <laughs> exactly. And then, in, in the past, you may have gone to your research team and said, "Hey, can you go and find this information for me?" And they would have gone into these archaic research libraries, um, and our one was as, as archaic as everybody else's. And you're downloading reports and you're trying to find information. Suddenly, it's boom. So the conversation we have with you is going to be immediate um, uh, alignment of what you found out with what your needs are, what your strategy is, versus let's go and have two hours just downloading information. So so there's an immediate advancement in the level of knowledge and information you have, and the role of the analyst is suddenly shifting from someone who's just giving information to somebody who has to now interpret that for you. Someone has to be more consultative. I can only imagine how that's going to impact the consulting industry as you look at uh, the needs of clients who, one, obviously need help, but two, their access to information is shifting by the minute as well. So surely the role of the consultant is going to get dramatically impacted uh, in the next couple of years as a result of this. Yeah, I think the, the consultants who learn how to use this and partner with the technology are going to be the winners. I, I don't see this technology can't do a whole lot on its own. If 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 we if you and I weren't here to prompt the technology, it doesn't come up with the ideas. It doesn't prompt itself. It's not it's not out identifying the uh, problems that have to be solved. It doesn't it doesn't do. It's not it's not sentient. Um, that's going to be a while uh, to your to your earlier question. Uh, this is a tool that makes humans much more effective, much more. Um, uh, I, responsive, you know, when when you're, you're using your research an analogy, um, you know, you, you're spending hours going through and look, pouring through old old reports, seeing what's relevant, that can be done now in just seconds. And uh, now you can look at it and you can you can understand the context that this is to be applied, and then it it makes you more effective. It makes you more responsive. It it uh, it helps. Uh, generate new ideas that you may have not have thought of, um, but you see something that it produced and it might not be quite right. You have to go back and and adjust it. And, you know, one of the things that's really different about working with this type of technology, we're not really used to governing technologies that are probabilistic. We're We're used to, you know, inputs, programming, outputs. And yep. if 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 the programming is right, the outputs are going to be predictable. In a prob with a probabilistic technology, as we're all learning, um, it can be wrong, just like people can be wrong. You know how many how many consultants or analysts or executives just get it wrong? It's not it's not that their training is bad or their experience is bad. It's just uh, sometimes the information's incomplete and you just make mistakes and. 
that's that's what we're dealing with with a with a neural network that's architected the way it is. It will attempt to give you the, the answer it believes you're looking for, and that may be wrong. So governing a uh, technology like that really requires a different approach to um, to working with the technology. So, you know, that's that's just something that we're going to have to build into the vernacular and into the governance and understand that, um, you know, we, we want to continue to improve it. And you, you improve it by improving the accuracy, the data that it reads. But, uh, you know, the, these large language models read a lot of data and there's a lot of noise in that data. Yeah. yeah. So, so what other technologies are exciting you besides Gen AI? Well, you know, I've been um, reluctant to jump into quantum for for years. I mean, we were looking at this back in 2016 and uh, 2017, and I thought it was a little bit too early to to get too excited about quantum. But I think uh, what I see with quantum and the development around and and some of the breakthroughs around error correction um, and uh, and just the usability of the quantum computer. Some of the some of the work that's been done around programming and interfacing with classical computers. I think that uh, quantum is not too far away uh, to be a usable, productive, economical um, addition to our classical computers. And there there are going to be problems we haven't even attempted to solve once we have usable quantum computers coming online. And um, so that's exciting. And, um, you know, that'll free up resources for computing resources for other things once we have um, usable, scalable quantum uh, computers. I think that's about five years away, um, realistically, maybe maybe a little bit more. Uh, but, um, you know, that's moving fast and it's going to be a, a, a gradual, gradual, all of a sudden uh, quantum is here. And uh, because it's following the same exponential curve GPT was following, you know, you had, I guess, in 2019, we looked at GPT uh, one when OpenAI was just released a research paper. They didn't call it GPT one. They just called it GPT. And then GPT two was a pretty nice improvement. Still a data scientist was required to access it. GPT-3 was a big leap from GPT-2, but you had to write code and scripts to, to get access to it. Yeah. And then 3.5 came out in November, and that changed the world because just everybody uh, could access that in just in, in natural language. Quantum is going to follow something that's very similar. It's um, Right now, it's very you know you you have to have a certain skill set to be able to use it or access it or understand it. Um, that's going to that that gap is going to continue to narrow, and as it narrows, the capabilities will continue to improve. The investment is flowing into it. Uh, you you've got a lot of governments, uh, big tech firms, um, research uh, institutions that are just pouring money into developing quantum and it's and it is a bit of a race um and when you know when that when that uh, breakthrough happens where you can have many more people using quantum then um then you, you know it'll it'll be a race to adoption much like G gpt is and uh, you know i think between now and let's say let's call it five years uh, the first use cases are going to be defined. Those will likely be in materials science and healthcare and biotechnology. You know, the, those types of um, maybe climate, um, those types of issues that are just very computing intense. Um, and then, uh, and then we'll see business applications, uh, probably human behavior uh, prediction those types of uh, things. And then you'll see quantum and AI converge. And, uh, you know, I think when quantum and AI converge, 
that's when you see the Ray Kurzweil type uh, of AI where it's indistinguishable, maybe even smarter than uh, human intelligence. Wow. I, I also think, I think uh, space connectivity um, is is very interesting. It's a very interesting technology to follow. You know, Starlink has reduced the cost of satellites, and uh, it's it's making it practical for enterprises to have their own satellites and connect their factories, connect their centers, um, no matter where they are in the world. Um, reducing the the cost of connectivity and improving the practicality of it it you know it, it does uh, accelerate the need for edge computing on prem computing so that's that's going to be a, a kind of you know part and parcel with the uh, increased satellite connectivity uh, but that's an interesting uh, field to follow this industry 4.0 is uh is very interesting and, and you know and it, it'll be catalyzed by a decoupling uh and diversification of the supply chain uh because yeah. manufacturing you know manufacturing is not just going to come out of china and go um in its same form elsewhere it's going to be much more automated uh it'll be much more digital and the manufacturing operating model is going to be much more connected than than it than it is today because the, the way it operates today is not a whole lot uh there's not a whole lot of difference from the 1950s uh and, <laughs> and how and how it operates today more computers right. it's faster but uh but i think this this move to um industry 4.0 will look more like a machine that builds the machine as uh, somebody once said so you know a lot of a lot of change happening there a uh, lot of change indeed. So I think uh, we got Gen AI is the new light bulb, and quantum will be the new electricity grid that sets it alight. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. This is so, fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. This has been really, really good. I love the way that you decided to think about the convergence of technology at the end as well, and the, uh, you know, from my perspective. The real technologies are the ones that people bring into the organizations, the ones that are actually adopted en masse. And, um, you know, everybody I know under the age of 25 is doing everything on ChatGPT, everyone. And, uh, you know, you can't operate now without leveraging uh, the technology. And we're all learning together. It almost feels like 1998 and the internet sort of all over again in, a, in, a, yeah. in, a, in an interesting way. Yeah, I, I think there'll be a crash too. I think uh, I think there will be a disillusionment crash because, um, you know, people it, as as amazing as this technology is, the expectations can always get, you know, inflated, and um, you know there is a cost to putting your own data uh, in creating a language model that is appropriate for the computing resources that you have access to. And, um, you know, if you're gonna build a small language model or a medium language model, or if you're gonna, if you're gonna build a language model that has a trillion parameters, you know, and, uh, and you, you've got that kind of data, um, you know, that's gonna have implications on computing. Uh, and, uh, and computing is going to be constrained for a while. Yeah. It's going to be hard to get these chips, these these GPUs and TPUs are really really difficult. It's not, you know, the 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 supply and demand are mismatched. And uh, if you if you kind of forecast that out for the next five years, ten years, um, you've got one plant that's capable of producing those types of chips. And uh, so there needs to be more of these these foundries to be built, you know, they're, they're being built, but it will take several years for them to get online and productive. Yes. I mean, you can see Amazon, Google, these companies trying to uh, rival NVIDIA and bring out uh, chips that can handle this, that can grow with this. But yeah, we're finally hitting a point where computing resources are becoming an issue. It's getting hard to scale this. Um, and scale this in a way that's safe and protects our data, everything. But uh, 
Yeah, I think it's a jolt our industry sort of needed to get things moving in terms of you can't actually take advantage of any of this if you're working on archaic data infrastructures, um, badly constructed process, you know, dinosaur type ways of operating. And my fear is, is that large scale businesses that have failed to you know, innovate themselves in the last 20, 30 years are going to really struggle because just smaller businesses are coming in now who can do things faster, quicker, more nimbler than ever before. Okay, Cliff, this has been terrific. Really enjoyed the time we had today. Hopefully we can get together again soon and talk some more about this stuff, but this has been good today. All right, Phil. Good to see you. Cheers. 